The view menu allows for control and visibility of various parts of the UDK interface. Starting here at the top, we have the browser windows, and you'll see a submenu with all the different browser windows you can open up. Though really, you could grab any one of them, and you're going to get a window that has tabs for all the others as well. So if you just grab the content browser, you can quickly jump over to the log or the start page, which are also included in that submenu. Now moving down from here, we have the actor properties window. You'll be using this a lot as you set up the objects in your scene, so... I'm actually here inside the VCTF Sandstorm level. I'm just going to select this static mesh. We'll go under View, come down to Actor Properties, and there you go. So there's the properties of this static mesh actor. Though admittedly, I never come up to the menu to open up this uh, particular window. You can just double-click on any object, and that will open up its properties. Or if you don't like double-clicking, you can press F4 as well, and that will open up its properties. Now, moving down from here, we have the Surface Properties window. Now, to really show off surface properties, I need to get over here to a BSP surface. So let's come over here to this little platform. And if we select this, this is an object that was created via BSP. I'm going to jump out of game mode so that we can see that it is selected. And if I open up the surface properties window by going under view, surface properties, we have a huge number of options here that will control how this surface looks. We can control the positioning of its texture, we can control its light map resolution. Just as a quick example, I'll pen its texture. So notice I'm clicking uh, the 4 in the U direction, and that's moving the texture 4 units along its U direction. I can also move it in V if I want, just as a quick example. So this is just a way to control those BSP surfaces. Now moving down, we have the World Properties window. This has got a lot of things that control your level in general, just all around properties that are applied to your entire world. You can control uh, various settings and light mass in here, as well as the zone info, which in this case shows the kill Z. This means that if your player drops below this altitude, they will die. So if you have a part of your level that's like a cliff that your player needs to fall off of, and when they fall, you need them to die, you can do that just by setting the kill Z to the altitude at which they need to die. Now, continuing down the menu, we have the ability to open up the Kismet and Matinee windows. So I'll just go ahead and open these up real quick. Here's the Kismet window with some Kismet sequences, in this case, powering a camera fly-through through Matinee. If you go down to Matinee, this will give you a sub-menu containing all of the different Matinee sequences applied to your level, provided there are any. Now, the Kismet and Matinee in and of themselves are something we're going to save for future lessons, but just as a case in point, I could open up this first sequence which is for that camera fly-through. And if we move the, ca the view kind of down a little bit, I can hit play, and you can see that down here inside our perspective, we've got a little camera fly-through preview taking place. But for now, we'll go ahead and stop that and close out of matinee. Now, continuing down the view menu, we have our drag grid, rotation grid, and scale grid settings. These control snapping. In short, the drag grid controls motion snapping, Rotation grid is rotation snapping, and scale grid is, of course, scale snapping. And these all work the same way. You can enable or disable them at the very top, and then you have the increment of snapping that you'd like. So in the case of the drag grid, if you set this to 16, as you move objects around in your scene, they're going to snap to 16 unit increments. Very, very straightforward. For rotation, you can snap to increments of around 6 degrees. There's a little bit of play in there, uh, as well as 45 and 90 degrees as well. And scale is going to snap to percentage. So do you want to scale up by snaps of 5% and then it'll jump to 10% and then 15 and so on and so forth. Now, as we continue down, we have the ability to set our auto save interval. This is how often UDK is going to save your level while you work. Now, you'll notice there's no option in here to turn auto save on and off. Actually, to do that, you need to come down to the lower right hand corner of your interface in the console bar. Way in the far right corner, there's a little checkbox to turn auto save on and off if you need to do that. Now, I generally leave that off for recording so that we don't get interrupted by a save window, but it's probably a good idea to leave that on just so you never lose any work. Now, moving down from here, we have detail mode. This allows us to have certain objects that are designated as high detail, and we can switch these on and off if we need to kind of speed up feedback in our viewport. So if I switch to low detail, you'll notice those mountains in the, in the background kind of disappear, and then we can put these back up to high, and boom, there they are again. Now, continuing... We have several different options, most of which can be found inside the main toolbar. Now, what I'm going to do is give you kind of a brief rundown of each one of these. And a lot of these are fairly specific. So if you don't fully understand their, uh, their nature after the description, 
it's just because at this point you haven't worked with that part of UDK yet. The more you work with UDK, the more this is all going to make a whole lot more sense. But I will give you a brief rundown on what these do. Allow translucent selection is for certain instances where you're using, say, static meshes that have a translucent material. Just as a case in point, perhaps you have a static mesh that's cone-shaped and has a material that makes it look like a volumetric light. You know when you shine a spotlight up into the air, how you can see that kind of cone of light reaching up into the sky? You could create a static mesh that mimics that. However, if you tried to select anything through that, the question is, do you want to select what's beyond that cone of light? Okay, maybe a wall that's in the distance, or do you want to select the cone of light itself? If you want to select the actual cone that's forming that, you need to switch on Allow Translucent Selection. You have the ability to draw the red builder brush. If it's getting in your way, maybe you have a small level and you just need to make the thing disappear, you can switch this on and off. Moving down, we have lock prefabs from selection. A prefab is a group of objects that you have designated that you decide need to go together. A really good example would be uh, perhaps a static mesh of a lamppost that's got a little light attached to the end of it, and maybe uh, a, a newspaper box that's always going to be right next to that, uh, that lap lamppost wherever you place it in a level. You could define all of those objects as a single prefab and move them around as one object. And really, the lock prefabs from selection just determines whether or not you want to be able to select those as a single prefab or as the individual components that make it up. Next, we have use curves for distributions. This is fairly particular to working with particle systems. There are certain values in particle systems, and let's just let's pick on an example. Let's say you've got a smoke particle system, where you've got this smoke that goes up into the air, and as it goes up, it's also increasing in size. So you've got some motion, and you've got a size increase over time. Now, inside, kind of under the hood of UDK, that is graphed out as a curve. That curve is plotting how large the particle is getting over its lifespan. However, calculating values as they change across a curve is fairly expensive. And so to save on the processing power of having to do that, UDK will bake everything out into what is called lookup tables. It's just kind of an internal chart where it says, all right, at one second into your life, you need to be this big. At two seconds, you need to be this big, and so on and so forth. However, this simplification can lead to it could potentially lead to problems if you're not getting the results you want. Perhaps you need it to be smoother to really see what's going on. And if that's the case, you can switch on use curves for distributions to kind of help you debug such problems. Next, we have enable socket snapping. I think the place where I use this the most is when I'm trying to put objects into characters' hands or attach an object to a character so they can hold it. A skeletal mesh, which would be what a general character is going to be made of if you're putting one into a level to animate, has got sockets on it. Now, a socket is really just a designated position where another object could potentially be attached. Case in point, you've got a character in your level who would have a socket at the location of their hand. So you could take another object, say a weapon, and snap it directly to that socket by using enable socket snapping. It's just an easy way to get objects positioned right into a skeletal mesh's socket. Moving down from here, we have enable particle system LOD. This is going to allow you to visualize different levels of detail for a particle system. Now, a really good example of this, just kind of a, in concept, would be if you had, say, a campfire particle system, which has got some flames and it's got some smoke coming up, and then little tiny sparks that are also kind of moving up through the smoke. If you were 300 yards away from that campfire, all you'd really see is a little tiny glowing orange dot in the distance. You wouldn't be able to see the individual flames. You might notice a slight flicker, but you surely wouldn't be able to see those sparks. However, by default, those sparks would be calculating unless there was a level of detail, an LOD, in place to take them away as the player moves further back. Switching on Enable Particle System LOD allows you to visualize those levels of detail right here inside your viewports. So if you need to edit them, if you decide, you know, we need to make that fire a little simpler if we're far away, or even make it a little more complex because now it's too simple, you can see that right here inside your viewport. You can also lock LODs in your view so that if you're far away, you can have the lower level LOD in place and then get closer and see what that low LOD looks like as you get close to it. Now down from here, we have enable quick proc building mode. Proc building is a procedural building generation system inside of Unreal Editor. It allows you to create buildings in a procedural system by, say, designating a window on the side of the building and then how many times that window is going to repeat and then those you can basically develop rule sets and then entire buildings like an entire cityscape could be created by way of these rules and if you want to be able to see that you can switch that on here now moving down 
we have the new floating viewport option. This is really straightforward. So if you want a new floating perspective view, you just click and boom, there you go. We have our very own brand new floating perspective view. When you're done with it, just close it and make it go away. Continuing, we have viewport configuration. This is this is where you can really start to customize how your viewports look. By default, this is set to two by two split, which is why we see these four viewports. But you could set it to something like one by two split, and you have one big viewport on the left and two smaller ones on the right. Again, very, very straightforward. Now, I do want to mention this. If this is not something that you will often see, but it could potentially come up. If you have been messing with your computer's resolution while UDK is running, or for a variety of other reasons, if you ever happen to notice that your viewports have gone blank or you don't see any information, consider coming in here to view and just setting your viewport configuration back to 2x2. Two two. It'll redraw the viewports and can clear up any tiny little issues like that. Now, that rarely ever happens. In fact, I think it's been years since I've ever seen it, but I thought I'd mention it just in case anybody ever experienced that. Now, moving along, we have full screen mode. This will hide away anything that is not UDK, including the Windows control bar at the top and the start bar, which you didn't even see at the bottom of my screen. So we'll go ahead and switch that back off. Down from here, we have several different lighting information windows. These are just debugging and info windows on how lighting is affecting various objects, uh, the overall result of your lighting, how it's working on static meshes, etc., and so forth. So until you're really getting hardcore into playing with lighting, you won't really need to use these just yet. However, a lot of these will come up automatically when you build lighting in your scene. Now, moving down, we have a few last-minute preferences. Enable WASD camera controls. This is on by default, and this is why if you hold the right mouse button, you can use WASD to fly around as if you're kind of in a first-person shooter. Now, if we continue down from the other preferences, we have resize top and bottom viewports together. If we switch this off, we can do this. So notice how I've got kind of a, a almost Z-shaped uh, breakup of our our windows here. Now if I come back down to our preferences and I turn on resize top and bottom together, now they always line up. That's all there is to it. Now the last couple of things we have here are drag moves the canvas. If you come over to an orthographic view, if I click with the left mouse button and drag, I'm just dragging that view around. So you can see a little tiny hand like it's grabbing the, the grid and just kind of moving it exactly where the mouse goes. That's one form of navigation. Now alternatively, if you turn off drag moves canvas, the whole view is going to move in the direction you move your mouse. So it's really just whichever method you prefer. The non-drag method is kind of the old school uh, Unreal navigation system. And then finally, we have center zoom along uh, around the cursor. This is really for the mouse wheel. Now, I've just switched it off, and if I mouse wheel in, you'll notice that I'm zooming in right toward the center of the view. However, if we come back in and turn that back on, I could put the cursor, say, over here in the lower right corner of the top view, and now we're zooming toward that area. So it's really just about using that mouse wheel and zooming in and out. So that is a look at the various options of the view menu. Again, a lot of these you probably won't be able to really uh, wrap your head around too much until you use UDK and start using these individual aspects of the editor. But that will wrap things up for this video. <laughs>